Hello viewers and welcome back. Thank you for liking this video. This is one of the best video on Aperture in YouTube that you can find. And I appreciate that you like it. And we have so many requests to do this title, Depth of Feel. If you have to watch one video and fully understand about Depth of Feel, this is the video. Viewers, some good news before we start today's video. Head on to my e-learning website now because we're celebrating and undergoing the 1111 promo. Everything from all the e-learning titles to the premium courses, the all access and including the online process program, 50% off. Hurry, because this promo is a limited time offer. What is depth of field? Take a look at this photo here. Punch in a little bit and you see that this is the sharpest point in the whole photo. And this one right here, just about sharp. And after that, everything else is not that sharp anymore. So if you take a look at the photo sideways, this is how it looks like. From here to here is sharp. And anything else and everything else, apart from this range, is blurry. This range here is depth of field. Okay, so great, you must be thinking like, okay, that's depth of field that is so easy to understand. So what's the big deal? Well, it's bigger than that. Depth of field has a complex formula, it's very difficult to calculate in its experience and it's governed by a lot of parameters. And not only that, it's totally useful in compositional and storytelling of photography. We're going to go through all this in detail in this episode here. So first off, depth of field only happens at the depth of the photo, which means that from here to here, going into the photo. It doesn't happen on the z-axis and it doesn't happen on the x-axis. It only happens on the y-axis, moving into the photo. And hence why it's called the depth. So you never get depth of field looking like this. You never get depth of field on the same plane, in other words. You cannot have a guy looking sharp and just right next to him, the girl looking blurred. Will never happen. Why do we need depth of field? You probably think that depth of field is more of an annoyance, a bug, than a feature. Well, it's actually a very useful tool in photography because depth of field does three things in photography. Number one, the distance. You have your subject here. At the back, that's the location. You separate the location from the subject, giving the impression to the viewer that, hey, this photo is about her. Not so much about the background, but anyway, this is where she is. So a background needs to be blurred because unless you're shooting a landscape photo. And that brings us to the second use of depth of field, one of my favorite and most powerful feature of depth of field, inclusion and exclusion. Take a look at this photo. There's a riot at the front. But these are the people that are causing the riot, not this guy though. He's just a passerby that was intrigued like how humans can be so violent. And he was in an attempt to cross the street. So notice that he was blurry. He was excluded. If this photo were to land in the police station, he'd probably get away scot-free because he's not part of it. Exclusion. This group of people here are included. So depth of field is a useful tool as a photographer that you can use to tell your viewers that, hey, this is one group, part of the subject. That is not part of the group. And that brings us to the third use of the depth of field. Backstory, setting an establishment, and the premise of your whole photo. And take a look at this photo, taken by Pulitzer winner Danish Siddiqui, one of the most admired photographers from India. Sadly, Siddiqui died shooting photos. More on Danish Siddiqui in premium courses where we celebrate great photos and great photographers. Look at this photo. This woman is a Rohingya refugee and she managed to escape her hardship in a new land, in a new country. Out of gratefulness and bliss, she bowed down and touched the land. And that at the back was the boat she arrived in. Without the boat, you won't even know she is a refugee. You won't even know how she arrived in this new land. This boat was the reason why she is still alive. The establishment and the backstory. So remember this, background a great backstory. It tells you and sets the premise of how she can be here in that photo. Well, you know, you know what, Yichong, remove that boat. Danny Siddiqui, wherever you are, I apologize for doing this. See how that photo changed drastically? And that's what I mean, what depth of field can do. A background that is amply blur will set a premise of any photo storytelling. Yeah, because there's, any, there's nothing else in this photo. It's her representing a new life, and that 
the old life. So that's what I mean by backstory, setting the premise. And that's what Dapofil is so great at. Okay, I want you to take a look at some of the photos that I really love. The way how these photographers use Dapofil to tell story. This one here from Sergei Ponomarev. An award-winning, in fact, he won the 2015 Breaking News Pulitzer Prize. And he won it for New York Times. If you look at this shot, I like it because that depth of field that he used that controls the whole layer of all the refugees. These people that you see on the boat here are refugees from Iran, Iraq and Afghanistan arriving at the shores of Greece. And these boatmen that sent them here were carrying 150 of them. And the moment he turned around and go back to Turkey, he was arrested. So what I like about this shot, it was clear that he focused on these men. But the depth of field made this subject at the front sharp too. And it starts falling off gradually. And it starts showing... In fact, if you look at this, this is a great example of where circle of confusion in a photo starts appearing. Exquisite use of that of field. Sometimes you show all, sometimes you show a little bit less. And in contrast, take a look at this shot from Mauricio Lima. This is an amazing shot that won him a Pulitzer Prize too. These are Syrian migrants waiting at the wheat field at the border of Hungary. There were barbed wires set up there preventing them from going in and they were hoping that they get accepted. Now what I like about this shot, that exquisite use of depth of field at the front. But Yi Chong, I noticed that the blur is slightly different. I mean, take a look at this shot, where it's shot with a normal lens. You can see that the plane where it's supposed to be shot, the depth of field area is supposed to be the same plane as in a parallel 90 degrees plane towards the camera. But this one looks a bit tilted. It looks a little bit like what you get when you use a tilt shift lens. You, you, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, because if you look at this lady here, she's supposed to be nearer to the camera. She's supposed to be blurrier, but no. This lady here, this woman here, is blurrier. At this moment, at this point, in this frame, the suffering is on this woman and her kid. If you want to be good in storytelling, know how much to blur in a photo. And the next point. Uh, Andrew, but what if everything is sharp in the photo? The two closest siblings of depth of field, sharpness and blurness. To really harness and understand depth of field, we need to understand sharpness and blurness. If everything is sharp in your photo, that means you have a very deep depth of field, which means that from here to here is sharp. And nowhere else in your photo is blur. And if you're in a room that is filled with smart people, it's very hard to find a dumb one. So having a not so smart person will make people look exceptionally sharp and smart. And here's my point. You need to have something blur in your photo to bring out that sharpness. And that's why the second sibling, blurness. And there's so many types of blur. You have Gaussian blur, you have lens blur, you have motion blur. You even have photographers being blurred. So that is why I would like to invite you to head on to my e-learning website here, where we have this course, Premium Courses, where every week we upload new lessons to Premium Courses. This can be about camera, settings, compositions, lighting, stock photos, commercial photography. And the newest addition is the type of blurness, how to achieve them realistically in photography. So coming back to Yi Chong's question, what happens if everything is sharp? Then everything is important. That's what you're trying to tell the viewers. And you can also land your eye everywhere. This works very good when it comes to a landscape photo, a scenery photo where you're telling people that, hey, look, everything is nice. You want to be here. Nothing is excluded. Or, speaking of nothing is excluded, family photos where the background is totally not that important and you want to get every aunt and uncle you have in that photo. Blurring one of them is going to offend and exclude one of them. So that's it. There are times where having everything sharp is totally important. And that's what I teach photographers. If you, you, know, you need to be instinctively know that to change your aperture, how much to blur, how near to stand to know what to include. And sometimes you have no brain to do that. Example, in event photography or in a wedding, where the last moment of the banquet dinner, where everybody is cheering everybody. So what do you do? You shoot everything sharp. Step back, use a high F value. Anything above F8 is going to be high. Shoot everything sharp and then go back 
and decide how you can blur this. And that's why our premium courses tutorial is very important. The types of blurs that you can get and how to realistically use post-processing to blur part of the photo that you want to exclude. So how do I know my depth of field? If you're a DSLR user, you probably see this button here. Just press on this button and your viewfinder will turn dark. Just eyeball from the front to the back and see at which point the sharpness falls off. When you see this, that's where the sharpness ends and that's your range of depth of field. It depends on how near you stand to the subject. If you're a mirrorless photographer and camera user, then simple. Just eyeball from front to back and see at which point is no longer sharp. So what affects the value of depth of field? Three things. The first one, your lens focal length. When you have a lens focal length that is very short, you tend to have a deeper depth of field. This lens, 85mm, is going to have a shallower depth of field. And that's why it looks so great when you use it to shoot portrait. But when it comes to shooting landscape, that's why you use lenses which are 11mm, 14mm. So the smaller the number, the deeper the depth of field. So secondly, the distance of the photographer to the subject. The nearer you stand to your subject, the blurrer the background is going to be. In other words, the shallower the depth of field is going to be. So if you have a lens, that the lowest f value you can get is f5.6, easy. Go nearer to the subject, zoom in completely, and that's how you get a blurrier background. And thirdly, your f value. A higher f value will give you a higher range of depth of field. A lower f value, well, all of you know this, is going to be shallower and the background more blur. And anything that's more far is going to be blurrier. And one of the best ways you can benefit from depth of field and all these three parameters, shooting fashion catalog. So you notice that we will use high F value, F8 to F11, and this will allow the models to move in the studio. So a little bit front, a little bit back will not be much of a matter because that is in the range of the depth of field. From here to here, it's going to be sharp. So that gives a more fluid and natural movement to the subject without the need to hold it really crazy pose the whole time. And that is why when it comes to beauty portraits, it's one of the toughest to shoot because the subject is being shot so close. And the subject needs to hold still. So simple, if you want to have your subjects a little bit of freedom in the studio, use your depth of field by varying these three values. So how does depth of field even happen? To explain this, we need illustration. That's you, the photographer, pointing a camera towards your subject, which is a man with his dog behind and he's holding a tennis ball for the dog to fetch. Now let's just remove the man and the camera and just leave it with a simple lens so that you can see this better. Assuming that you're focusing on the man's eye, this would land exactly on your camera's focal plane and sensor here. And whatever that's at the front of your subject will always land behind the focal plane. And then you have the dog behind. Rays of light coming from the dog's face would then fall in front of the focal plane. And to make this easier for you to understand, this range here, from here to here, is where it will appear sharp to you. But this area here, this is blurry. In fact, blurry and sharp is relative. And that's why camera scientists and engineers call this the circle of confusion. I know this is confusing, but you need to now look at the depth of field formula. This is how it looks like. I don't expect you to remember this, but just understand that it depends on four parameters. Number one, it depends on the F number of the lens that you use. Number two, the distance of you as a photographer, how far you stand away from the man and the dog and the tennis ball. And then C, the circle of confusion. I don't want you to get confused at this point. And then lastly, your lens focal length. This will determine your depth of field in formula-wise. So to summarize this, depth of field is how your viewers perceive which part of your photos being sharp. And being sharp is so confusing. That's why we have circle of confusion. It's like time. Yichong, I'm supposed to meet you at 4. Would you consider me late if I appear at 4.02 p.m.? No. No. What about 4.05? Borderline. Okay. 4.15? Late. Late. Okay, you don't exactly care whether I'm early, but the point is that from 4 p.m. to 4.05 in most culture, except unless you are <coughs> in Japan, where you're one minute late, you're late. This will appear as not late. Acceptable. And this is where it gets confusing, the circle of confusion of lateness. So in other words, 
That's why they use this term. Circle of confusion is where things start to appear blur. Okay, I know that formula made you crazy. Let's summarize this. What are the things that I need to know that will reduce or increase my depth of field as a photographer? Summarizing from that formula. Number one, the focal length of your lens. If you use an 85 millimeter, you're gonna get a shallower depth of field compared to a 14 millimeter lens. So background more blurry. Number two, your F number. Using F2 would create a shallower depth of field background more blurry compared to F16. Number three, standing nearer to your subject would make your background more blurry, hence reducing your depth of field. And fourth, that circular confusion thing, you can kind of equate it to your sensor size. Think about this. Every photographer knows that when you have a full frame sensor, the background blur is going to look nicer. Why is it so simple? Because your lens would then need to project a bigger field of view to a bigger screen, which is your sensor. And that's why it's looking so yummy. In other words, you're going to have a nicer circle of color. Okay, I promise not to use that word on you again. Just blur your background when your sensor is bigger. And that is why when you use a medium format camera, they're going to swear to you that, wow, the background is so beautifully, subtly, blurry, nice, as compared to your APS-C. You know, we should do a sensor size thing, a video all about sensor size in another episode. Oh, hey, YouTube exclusive members, Yi Chong and I have just experimented something with the depth of field and circle of confusion with me moving towards the camera. So I see you in backstage and we learn how this crazy formula and all this depth of field and circle of confusion works in real life. Well done viewers, you have reached the end of the depth of field tutorial. See, I told you it isn't that tough as long as you don't land yourself in that circle of confusion. Before we go, there are two things I ask of you. Number one, visit Jonathan Sachs' website. This is an impressive website because he made it so interactive. You know what he did? He shot a series of photos of his model Nicole and it varied the F number and put it into an interactive app kind of thing on the website by changing the slider you can see how the F number affects that profile and see which part is blur which part is sharp Jonathan thank you that's an amazing website number two head on to my website because my website is undergoing a 1111 promo everything in our website is 50% off from all the e-learnings to the premium courses to the all access and also our online pro set program. This offer will not stay on there long, so go now and enjoy the 50% promo. I'll see you soon and I hope I get your support. What happens if everything is sharp? Then everything is important. No exclusion. Anna. Mahathir! <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> My favorite guy of depth of field in photography. What is the first one? <laughs>